Um, we went through everything. You could go before Tiffany. We went through everything. I want to go through kind of the timeline with you. We already went over the seven seals. Everyone remembers the seven seals. Um, seven seals that get opened in the book of Revelations. These seals are on the scroll, the title deed to earth. We went through those. The seven trumpets. Every time one of those things happen, whether it's a seal, whether it's a trumpet, whether it's one of the seven bowls, something happens, whether on heaven or on earth. The whole book of Revelations is a roadmap to the return of Jesus. So... We have the seven trumpets, and you can see rapture at the seventh trumpet. That's where we all left. So when we went into the bowls, none of us, hopefully in this room, are going to be experiencing that in any way. So you have the seven bowls. Then you have the return of Christ, the millennial reign, and eternal judgment. There's more, right? Um, So what I want to focus on today is where we left off the rapture. You know, we we have such a short window down here to do something for Christ. Here we get to do something, and it's a work by faith. It's a work because he's not here with us right now. I mean, his spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here, but he is not with us. We're believing by faith to live for him and to do his will here on earth and try to save as many people as possible. Here is where you really get to earn your stripes, because once he comes back, going to kind of be a given. I mean, if Jesus himself is on the earth, do you think the world's going to be chaotic or have any problems? Probably not. I mean, people are still people and there's free will. We'll we'll get into that. But for the most part, when Jesus comes back, he's coming to restore things. So right now we have this small window where we can make an impact on people's lives, where we can really invest in the kingdom. And we kind of have to take it seriously and be sober. And and there's going to be multiple scriptures we'll go through that's really going to reinforce the fact that you don't have eternity down here. This body, this time, it's temporal. It's short-lived. And that you should be taking every moment uh, as a precious time with your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers. Because once that window's closed, it's closed. All right. So, <clears throat> let's get back to the rapture previously on, the revelation. Um... We'll start... How'd you get to Matthew? Can you back up one? All right. It's not up there. First Corinthians, turn your Bibles. You should all have Bibles. Don't rely on that. Don't rely on technology. <laughs> First Corinthians... Chapter 15, verse 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is to the church of Corinth. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So to the church of Corinth, he's writing, and he's telling them, when is it going to happen? The last trump. I'm just doing that so that way you guys don't think I'm making stuff up. The seventh trumpet blows. We go. Where do we go? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. Now you should be able to go back, Tiffany. I don't know why that one was not in there. We'll just we'll just let it go. We'll we'll just let it go. It's okay. Yeah, the series on excellence is coming up. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Um, she's like, it wasn't there. I saw her click backwards. We'll get we'll get to the soul. Don't worry too. The soul then excellence. Um, Matthew. Uh, so then we're gonna go Matthew twenty four verse thirty and thirty one. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn. Why would they mourn? Because they weren't ready. Then we'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call to gather his elect from the four winds, from from one end of the earth to the other. 
Everyone clear. Trumpet sounds. We go. Sweet. I don't have to keep beating that dead horse. All right. Last one I want to because I want to tell you where we go when we get taken up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, because here he is writing to the church. Everyone know when you get to like Thessalonians, Corinthians, all of those, those are letters to the church that the apostles are writing. And they're basically overseeing the church and they're trying to help guide them. And so they're saying, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, considering them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. He's talking about people who are asleep at the wheel. See, the Bible says to be vigilant and be sober for the coming of the Lord. He says some will be asleep, but some will be awake. And the ones that are awake are the ones that are going to enter in. The ones that are asleep, he's telling them, don't be sorry about them. He's going to talk about it. Even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All right. So we get taken up, and it says that we meet him, and it says we meet him in the air, and we will be with him forever. If you make that first rapture, you're done. Boom. That's, that, is, that, is your, uh, that is your ticket to heaven. You are safe. You have finished the race. That is the finish line. There's still work to do in the millennial reign. We all get to rule and reign with him, but that's the finish line. And it says we'll be with Jesus forever. We never have to worry about being apart from him. See, down here, we have faith and we have hope and we believe that in our hearts we are saved, right? We have that confidence. There, it's, it's a done deal. Man, what a, what a joyous time. Amen? And we get caught up. So we get caught up in the air and, and a lot of people are like, well, what's the point? Like, why do we meet him in the air? Why aren't we meeting him in heaven? And it's because it's not time for heaven yet. We meet with him in the air for the marriage supper. So I'm going to go through what the marriage supper of the Lamb is, the importance of it, and how, and how Jesus, really this whole thing has been orchestrated over Jesus' entire lifetime. Um, so let's get back to Revelations. Now that we all agree, the last trumpet, we go, right? We all agree, we meet in the air, we meet Jesus. We're not in heaven, we meet in the air. All right. Revelations chapter, ni- Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 is where we're going to start. This is after we get taken up. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters and the voice of many thundering saying, Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, this angel, saying to him, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's talk about that. Who is the bride? We are. We are the bride of Christ. We are, we are preparing ourselves for his return. There's so many scriptures where, where, uh, where the word gets tied back and it says, Husbands, love your wives as what? Christ loved the church. He uses marriage because marriage is, it's about two things. The husband, what is the husband supposed to do in a marriage? Provide. Covering protect right that is what a husband is supposed to do in a marriage and he uses marriage as symbolism because that's exactly what god's heart is towards us god's heart is he wanted us to be a part of his family so he had his son jesus pave the way so that we could all be sons of god 
right? And then for the wife, the wife is to submit to the husband, right? And I know some people are like, well, you know, that's not really the way things are done these days and gender roles and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to get into that. That's just a dead end. But what I do want to focus on is that women, you are supposed to submit to your husbands. You're supposed to, when you marry your husband, you align yourself to their vision. What is your purpose in life? And I'm here to support that. I'm here to come alongside and work with you on what you're doing. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what good wives do. They align with their husbands, and then they both move forward, right, in that vision. So here Christ is the, is the groom, and the church is the bride. I want to talk to you a little bit about traditional marriages, because when you look at marriages, yeah, you can move forward. When you look at marriages in the Bible, really in history, but primarily in, like, probably 50 A.D. on, it became a bigger tradition. It was broken up into three phases. So you had the betrothal period, the announcement and procession, and then the marriage ceremony and feast. Uh, hit a button. Like forward. How do you click forward? Arrows? There we go. We're getting there. By the end of this sermon, it'll be a well-oiled machine. <laughs> All right, one more forward. There we go. All right, so traditional weddings, you had the betrothal period, the announcement in procession, and the marriage ceremony and feast. That was what a traditional wedding consisted of. Now, the betrothal period was extremely important. This was, and it sounds carnal, but this was the contract period. This was the husband going to the family of the bride, the, well, the husband-to-be, going to the family of the bride and agreeing to pay off all her debt, agreeing to take her on and take care of all of her needs and have a dowry set aside of this is what I'm able to provide for her, right? The agreement to pay for the wedding, the agreement as far as what the parents have to do and what their side of the deal is, which is handing over their daughter. I know that sounds extremely carnal, but it's, it's an important part of the marriage because it's a commitment. It's decided then that this should take place and that this should happen. So it's a, it's a contract. So the whole point of that is to be able to say that if I'm going to give you my daughter, I need to know that you're going to take care of her, that she'll wipe out all the debt, that she'll never want or need for anything, that she'll be constantly protected, that she'll be in good health, that you are an honorable man who can take care of my, my daughter. That's the whole point. Did Jesus wipe out our debt? Control the period's done. He went to the cross and paid for all of our debts. Right? All our sin was washed away in that moment. Done. Betrothal period met. What did he say? If you believe in me, you'll not perish but have everlasting life. That's the contract. Now, unfortunately, there's people that don't say yes to Jesus. But the contract is still available to them. He says, I've done my end. The dowry is set aside. And if you agree to marry me, this is everything that you'll get. That's right. All right. Now, the announcement and procession was another extremely important part. It would begin at the groom's house. And it would be the groom with all of his best men, right? And they would have this parade. And they would go from his house all the way through the streets of the city. Music. And they would be like, they would have guys juggling things and flags. And it would be like a parade from his house all the way to the bride's house. And then the bride would meet him with all of her maidens. And then they would travel back to his house for the wedding. Sometimes they didn't live in the same city. So that could be days, months even, of a journey. That's a long parade. But the purpose of it was, it was to let everyone know that this was taking place. So there wouldn't be a single person that would be like, oh, you know, Joe and Sally got married. And they'd be like, what? I didn't know. How could you not know? Right? The city is lying. So in the same way that Christ, he went and died, right, on the cross and paid for our sins, that was, that was the, the, the betrothal period. He now has all these signs in the heavens that he's returning. He's leaving his house and coming to our house to pick us up for the wedding. Right? 
So all those signs and things that we see when, when we see the seals get broken or we see, see the trumpet sound and all of a sudden it's disaster and everyone's panicking and freaking out over it and we're calm and even joyous to be like, man, that means Jesus is coming back. Don't you get it? Don't you get it that the King of Kings is returning and guess what? He's coming for me. He can come for you too if you want, right? That's the whole point. But we should be looking at that announcement and procession as all the signs of the end times. That's what it does. It anchors us further with hope that he's returning for us. And then there's the marriage ceremony and feast, which is the third and final phase. That's the happy, happiest part. Where all the guests show up, even some people who just saw the parade start joining in and come to enjoy the feast. So they all show up and it's at, it's at the, the groom, well, it's at a venue. Sometimes it's the groom's house, sometimes it's somewhere else. It just depends on how many people they have to accommodate for. So at the marriage supper, they have a huge feast, tons of music. Then the wedding takes place in the exchange of the rings, right? All of that takes place. The, the most pivotal part, though, is when the groom is responsible for giving gifts to those who have served in his wedding, all of his best men, the bride and, and her maidens. He gives gifts to all of those who took part and labored to make that wedding happen. He gives those things out to them. That is, there's customary that he does that. Nowadays, you know, we've gotten a lot cheaper, and the groom just gives his best men stuff. I mean, not, to be fair, we pay the DJ. It's not like people get stuff for free. Like, we pay them money. But the whole point of the gifts was it was something that said, hey, I know how hard you worked. I know it wasn't easy to make sure the venue looked nice and the flowers and all that stuff. Not just payment for those things, because he had to pay it. He would give a gift, and that gift would be personal to that person saying, hey, I know you and I know what you've done and I know your labor. Here's your gift. That's what we get. So the whole point when we read Revelations that we get taken up, it is the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're rejoicing and happy because now the bride is reunited with Christ, is united with Christ, right? But it's also about the exchanging of gifts. So we're going to get into that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the word all, when he writes it, again, it's Corinthians. So who is he writing to? The church. Okay. Because a lot of people will say, well, he said all. That's right, all. That word all is actually talking about the all as in all the parts that make up a whole, everything that applies, the church. So he's saying you all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat in the Greek is the word bema. How many of y'all watched the bema judgment video? Good. Those of you who haven't, you should watch it. It's on YouTube. It's a one-guy play, basically. Um, There's a few extras, but they don't really have lines. And it's this guy's narration of the bema judgment. And it's extremely impactful, so you should watch it. Bema judgment, B-E-M-A. Yeah, yeah, the church posted it, so. But the judgment seat is known as the Bema. This was a tribunal seat. Pilate had a judgment seat when he was with Jesus, when he had to judge on him, on whether or not he was to die or not. That was that was a Bema judgment. It is a place where um, where you would judge the value of goods, receive gifts or sent or apply uh, like a sentencing basically so in that moment Jesus came and Pilate was on a judgment seat and he didn't want to kill him I think Pilate saw the value in Jesus but he was swayed by men good thing is this scripture says judgment seat of who Christ so we don't have to worry about an impartial judge he's not worried about the faces of men he is a ju- he's just and good So here it says that we must all uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ and that each one may be recompensed for his good deed, for his deeds in the body. That word recompensed in the Greek is 2865, kamitso, which means to receive back, receive what was belonged to you, what what was promised to you. Mark 29 talks about that you haven't lost brothers or sisters or houses or land that you won't get back. How much? A hundredfold, and then he said, in this lifetime. 
with persecution. <laughs> but here there are things that were promised to us. Things that, that, God wa- that Jesus wants to give us to say, man, you were so good. Look at everything you did. And it says, deeds in the body. Look at everything you did for my church, for my people. And it says that they get recompensed. And it says what he has done. I was talking with my dad earlier before service. It's what he did, right? What you do is what you will get rewarded for. Not your intentions, right? Not your beliefs. Your beliefs will determine whether or not you make it, right? Whether you believe in Christ or not will determine whether or not you get to meet him in the clouds, marriage, supper, and then eventually heaven. That will determine that. But your deeds are what you are rewarded for. You see, sometimes people say, well, God is God is fair. God is just. He absolutely is. That does not mean that he's going to give everyone the same things. They say, well, God loves us all equally. It's true. He loves us all equally. I love all my kids equally, but I don't reward them all the same. Right. I love Cooper just as much as I love Oliver. Oliver is an emotional roller coaster at times. That kid is. He just goes up and down. I love him the same as Cooper, but I tend to reward Cooper more because Cooper will obey more. He obeys quicker. His heart is easily turned. And I don't feel like, a, a, like an unfair, or unjust father to do that because Cooper knows why he gets rewarded when he does. Lincoln knows why he gets rewarded when he does. They also know why they get punished when they, do, when they don't do what they're supposed to. That's what just means. It means I look and I assess at what you've done and I give you an adequate punishment or reward for that. But it doesn't mean it's all the same. I don't think that a guy that gets saved on his deathbed is going to get the same rewards as Billy Graham. That would not be fair. That would not be just. So we need to get out of that mindset that, oh, I just want to make it there, or I think once we get there, there's this deception of the church that, you know, you know, eventually that God, whether he saves everybody at the end, says, you know what, forget about it. There is no eternal judgment. Everybody come to heaven. Everybody gets it. He's like, Oprah, you get a car. Like, everybody's getting stuff. And he just decides that, you know what, none of the Bible's true. I've changed my mind. And that's a deception in the church. That you truly believe that God will look at someone's life and say, you lived for me, you died for me daily. You gave up your life for the needs of others and for the needs of the church. And this guy died on his deathbed and for him to give them both the same. It would put resentment in your heart to say, well, then why did I do all that, Jesus? You see, he is just. So it is for what you have done. So think about that. And I, I challenge you over the week to really think about all the opportunities you've had and you've been faced with a choice to either refer to God and do His will or do your own. And when you choose Him and His will, boom, you've done something for the body, for Christ. When you do it for yourself, you get your reward down here. You will not get anything up there. All right. All right, Romans 14.10. He's writing and he says, but why do you judge your brother? I'm just going to paraphrase because it's, new, it's King James. And why do you have not against your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, talking to the church, trying to get them to understand that stop bickering, stop arguing, stop saying, I'm going I'm to get more than you. You shouldn't get this. You shouldn't get that. None of you are judges. He's saying you will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then Timoth, 2 Timothy 4.8. Henceforth there is laid upon, up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Some, some different scriptures will say those that look for his appearing, but I like uh, the way that the King James reads and says, love his appearing. It's a longing for his appearing. You're going to get a crown He says, you'll be awarded this crown. Why do you need a crown? Because you're going to rule and reign with him. Remember, this is all the feast. This great wedding has happened. We get to see Jesus face to face. And all the while, the earth is being turned upside down. Bowls are being poured out. Judgment and wrath is coming to the earth. Because now everyone that is saved is removed from the earth. Now there is no life left on the earth. I mean, there's people down here. But there's nobody for Christ left down here. These are all the people that rejected him and refused him. And all, remember we talked about several weeks ago now, all the prayers we had of saying, God, 
bring justice. God, this person, what they've done to these people, whether it's human trafficking or drugs or whatever, that they've caused so much pain and harm in other people, murderers and things like that, and we ask God for justice, that's what those bowls are. So while we're having this feast, these bowls of wrath are being poured out, still trying to turn the hearts of men. But it's joyous for us. We're at a party. Amen? And we're getting these gifts because he says, your work's not done yet. Right? Is a marriage over the moment you have the wedding? You just say, great, we're married. Okay, bye. And then that's it. That Our life ends right there. No, you have to live together. A marriage is more than just a ceremony. The ceremony is just the, the proclamation and the demonstration of your love for each other. But then you live the rest of your life with them. Right? Right now we're in this betrothal fe- period where, or actually I'm hoping we're more towards the announcement and procession, where we were longing for him to come back so we can be united with him. We have fellowship with him because we have fellowship through the Spirit. But we're going to enter into a whole new level of fellowship. See, when I was engaged with Manny, we could talk over the phone, and we could text back and forth, and we had love one for another, but we didn't truly fellowship until we got married. And then we started our life together. It'll be 11 years in November for all you doubters. I see you. I see you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, but a, marriage ha- a marriage continues afterwards. But Mandy and I, we, you know, we, we, we had saved ourselves for each other. And on a, our wedding was a ceremony. We had a, whole, we, we had a whole marriage after that. And I knew Mandy at a deeper level. And then from then on, and we still find out things about each other constantly. You know, she burped the other day in front of me. First time in like 10 years. Yeah. But every day that I'm in this marriage and this committed relationship, now that we're physically together and living in the same house and I can actually engage her, then it allows us to grow closer. We think we're close to God now or Jesus now. We get so much closer with that marriage supper. But it doesn't end there. It's not like, okay, Dave doesn't punch his card and say, all right, Jesus, cross the finish line. Give me my crown. I'm going to sit on my throne and do nothing all day. <laughs> as much as we think that would be wonderful, we have things to do. And man, if we get rewarded, and it says that we get to take on that immortality, remember the scripture, right? The perishable body becomes imperishable. The, immortal bo- the mortal body becomes immortal. We step into that renewed body Man, I want to do things for Jesus. I want to do things for him. So after this marriage supper, and we've all got gifts, and we've all been blessed, and we just had this wonderful party. Then Revelation 19, verse 11 through 14. He says, guys, it's not over. This was just the party. This was just the wedding. He says, there's still people down there we got to go after. There's still, there's still people that need to be judged. Right? So verse 11, Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened up. Now that word heaven refers to the aerial heavens. So there's, there's, in the Bible it refers to heavens in multiple different ways. There's the sky, the heavens. The heavens talks about the sky or the stars that you see. They call that the heavens. Then there's the aerial heavens, which is like within the atmosphere itself, like the spirit realm, Right? There are angels that, that are constantly trying to bless us and cover us because we pray for protection and things like that. They, they are in that realm as well. Um, demonic forces, those things are constantly at war. That's the aerial heavens. And then it talks about the heavens, that there's the heavens, the gates to heaven. And then it talks about the throne room of God, which is where God sits. So there's different heavens, different levels of heaven that are referred to in the Bible. This one is talking about the aerial heavens, which is where we were. We were just in the clouds, right? We didn't go somewhere, we didn't go somewhere else. We were in the aerial heavens, wherever we are. And it says, it opened up, and behold, a white horse. That word white, again, just like the previous uh, teachings we did, it's brilliant. He calls it white because he's like, that's the only way I could describe it. But imagine just this shining light, just shining from within. White horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and his right and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now that word judge is different than the judgment seat of Christ. That word judge is the Greek word krino. It's 2919, if you want to look it up. 
It means to judge as in a trial of punishment. It actually references that as if you were to commit murder and you were to be judged. So when it says he comes to judge and make war, he's not coming to judge anybody that's saved. Where are the saved people? We're with him. Right? But he is coming to judge and make war for those who've committed murder. Um, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. When it says a name that no one knew, no one bore this title. He's the only one. Right? He is the only one, but he himself, no man knew. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. Who's the Word of God? Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We come back restored, brilliant, renewed, with these everlasting bodies, these immortal bodies. We have just had the greatest party ever this rally, and Jesus says, okay, let's go destroy the wicked. The good news is we show up and don't have to do anything. We just look nice. He does all the work. If you continue in Revelations, it says a sword comes out of his mouth. He devours and cuts people down. He judges. We just get to ride alongside and be like, yep, that's the groom. We're all the bride. He gets to do all the heavy lifting. Now, it says that it was dipped in blood. Again, that word blood is hama. It's uh, the Greek 129. It means to exact anyone the penalty for another's death. So again, John is describing this blood vesture. I'm not thinking it's actually like dripping in blood, but he compared it to the blood that they would use in the Greek that says you have to pay. You have to pay for the blood you spilled. Jesus, when he comes back and makes that war against them, remember, these are wicked people. These are the people who do human trafficking every day, all day, commit countless crimes against their fellow man, refuse and reject Jesus. Because keep in mind, all while we're out there having this party, there's angels flying all around the earth saying, Jesus is coming back. Don't take the mark of the beast. Jesus is coming back. There's never going to be, you're never going to have someone who's going to say, I didn't know Jesus existed. Even the aborigines or the people who live deep in the jungles who still wear loincloths and hunt animals for food and do not speak any English will know because angels will visit them and show them and say, Jesus is coming. So there's going to be no excuse. When he comes back and he judges the wicked, if you're still wicked, you've been given every opportunity. And I tell you, the more more I've gone through this, the more I've been anchored with it. Because I used to think, man, just what about the people that don't have Bibles and the people that don't know that Jesus exists and all that kind of stuff? And we need to get missionaries, and I think missionaries are great and we need to have them because we want to save as many as we can now. But I'm not fearful for those that are in deep places of the earth that might not hear the word of God from a man's mouth because I know God's got it covered with angels. Amen? All right. So we get to come back. We're white and clean. Now, I'm not going to continue down that verse, but you can. And it talks about him destroying the beast. And these armies come to meet him. And these armies come to meet him and make war with him. I'm wondering who these people are. They're so deceived and drunk in their own blood and power that they actually believe that this guy who just appeared in the sky with an army of millions of people on flying white horses, and they're like, yeah, we could still take him. Come on, guys. It's like when Samson is fighting those Philistines, right? And he's got all those guys. He kills, what, a thousand men? 990 guys dead. Last 10 guys standing there. Uh, well, we can take him. He's, he's, he's slowing down. <laughs> he's not swinging that, club, that bone uh, as fast as he was before. But who are those people? Right? That's still... You know, the Bible says that if you're friends with the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And it's not because God changes, it's because you do. When you make friends with the world, you start making compromises. And those compromises start to water down what Christ has put within you. And all of a sudden, the things that he says don't do, you tend to start thinking, well, well, maybe in these cases. Love is love, right? So maybe for these people, it'll work. That's not what the scripture says. You see, and eventually what will happen is, if you are friends with the world, the world starts getting in you, and then you will start resisting God. You'll start resisting his, his judgments and his scriptures, 
and start pushing back against them. You become an, you see God as the enemy. It's not that God sees you as the enemy. He still sees you as his son and daughter. When the scripture says you make yourself an enemy of God, it's not that God sees you now as the enemy. It's that you see him as the enemy. And here Jesus comes back and has to make war against these people because they're just refusing. All right. So you can continue reading that in another time, but that's the, that's, that's the crescendo. That's the important part. So we come back. We ride with him. Skip to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold uh, on the dragon, that old serpent. I love that it writes that old serpent. Man, he is an old serpent. Which is the devil and Satan. Making sure you're clear. It is Satan. In case you didn't know, there's four different names for you. The dragon, old serpent, devil, Satan. I think that covers everything. And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, sealed his mouth shut, that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little while. It says for a season at times. So God doesn't destroy Satan right then. Jesus comes back, boom, judges all those who took the mark, it says. All those who took the mark. Is everyone going to take the mark? No. So this is important. Everyone who took the mark, gone. There are people who didn't take the mark. There's people who are going to get saved after the rapture. They're going to say, Jesus was real. Danielle was right. I wish I would have listened to her. I wish I would have listened to her. But she told me, so then they're going to start reading. Right? And then they're going to hear angels in the heavens. Don't take the mark. Don't take the mark. Don't take the mark. And guess what? They're not going to take it. And they're going to live through this whole thing. Jesus is going to come back, and we're going to have a thousand years where we rule and reign with him. And during that thousand years, there's going to be a lot of people. Imagine if if you're immortal. Do you die? No. I mean, Mandy and I have been married. uh, It'll be 11 years in November, and we have three kids with a fourth on the way. So now... Four kids in 11 years. If I was to live a 1,000, that's 400 kids, people. She's shaking her head no. But that's the math. Math doesn't lie. That's the math. (coughs) So there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be born into this millennial reign. The reason why Satan isn't destroyed is because all of those people who were just born into this have never been tempted or tried like we have. They've never been given... They've been given free will, but what's the choice when the only choice is Christ? Right? And and, and God said he's not a respecter of persons, right? He's going to give everyone the opportunity to choose. Life and death. Choose life. That's what he tells them. So in this millennial reign, the reason why Satan is just locked in a bottomless pit and not thrown out is because there's still going to be people who need to be tempted. Because they need to know there are other options. I wouldn't recommend it. But there is another option. All right, so Satan is bound for a thousand years, but that's why it says he is not to deceive until the thousand years is fulfilled and that he gets loosed for a little season. We'll get back to that. To be continued. Move on down to verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. They, us. And judgment was given unto them. We were given the power to judge. We're not being judged again. We already were. We already had the Bema judgment. We are given the power now to judge. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast or his image, never, never received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. These are all the people that die unsaved. They're still in hell <clears throat> that whole time. There's not been a judgment yet for them. Excuse me. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, If we endure, we also will reign with Christ. If we deny him, he will deny us. There's multiple scriptures that talk through about how you will rule and reign with Christ. But I want to focus on one uh, parable. So turn to Luke 
chapter 19. <clears throat> We're going to start with, we'll start with verse 16, but I'll give you the pref, but you can start at verse 11 for the beginning of the parable. The whole point is there's this rich ruler who goes and he gives his servants um, some uh, funds in order to go and invest, basically. He tells them, here, I've given you this great money. I need you to go and invest it. I need you to go and make sure that you can produce more with it. And some servant, verse 16, it says the first comes back and he says, hey, I've gained 10 pounds, right? You gave me one. I came back with 10. And the Lord says, that's a, that's a great stewardship. He says, you've been faithful with that little bit. Now you're going to rule over 10 cities. Imagine being a servant and you have a Lord over you, right? There's a Lord of the land and the Lord pulls you in as a servant and says, here, I need you to go do something with this. And you come back and you say, look, that one I turned into 10. Now keep in mind, you're just a servant. And then he says, you were so faithful with that, you get to rule 10 cities. Holy cow. Exponentially greater. I mean, that guy could have just went on the stock market and been like, boom, 10 pounds, done. But it's about the stewardship of it. And then the second one comes forth and says, hey, I was able to generate five pounds based on what you give me. And he said, likewise unto him, I'll give you the ruler of five cities. This parable that, he sa- that he's teaching is all about your stewardship with what you've had. Now there's another servant who takes that and he buries it in the dirt. And he pretends like it doesn't exist. And then when, he com- then when the Lord comes for it and says, okay, what do you got? He digs it up and he goes, here you go. I still got it. I still got the one. He wasn't able to actually enter in. He didn't get any rewards, nothing. What happened to him? He got thrown out. You were not a steward. If he gives you something, it's not for you to keep it and bury it in the sand. It's for you to go and give it out. It's for you to go and invest it. And then at the end, he says, now I'll give you rulership over ten cities, five cities. Matthew 25, verse 21, it's the same parable. He, it says, faithful and little, faithful and much. That's where we get that scripture. Your stewardship. If I give my, when my kid's old enough to drive and I give him something, my first car was a Toyota Camry. 1995, 96, something like that. White Toyota Camry. It wasn't a Mustang, like Garrett. Um, but if my parents had gotten me like a Lamborghini, do you think that's a good car for a first-time driver? Have I proven my ability to do anything? Let's start earlier. If I had a bike and I just thrashed it, tires always popped, the spokes on the wheel constantly broken, seats barely hanging on, I had to like re-screw it with like, you know, br- brackets and stuff like that. It's just dirty, muddy. I leave it in the front yard. It's been driven over a few times by a car. Do you think my father would give me a car when I'm able to drive? Why? Because you didn't take care of the things you had. Why would I get you something even greater if you're not going to take care of the small things I give you? So here, Christ is saying the same thing in this parable. He's saying, I'm giving you something that has the potential to be something more. And if you make it more and you invest it and turn it around for a profit for the kingdom, then I know I can trust you to actually rule over people. All right. Okay. So, blessed is he that part in the first resurrection, and on such the second death have no power. My dad and I were talking about this this morning. When you are born to this earth... And then you are born again, you only have one death. You get taken to heaven or you die and then go to heaven. That's it. There's only one death. If you were born in this earth and you do not get saved, you never are born again. You die twice. You die once to the earth and then you're eternally judged and you have a second death. That's what the Bible is referring to right here where it says the second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. The very next scripture goes right into Satan loose. So it doesn't give us a whole lot on the millennial reign. It just says we're going to rule and reign for a thousand years. But if you look back, Isaiah 65 has a prophecy, uh, verses 17 through 24, where it talks about um, uh, the rod of Jesse, and it talks about the descendant of Jesse establishing peace. And it says that the wolf will lie with the lamb, that there'll be kids playing with cobras, that the animals, that the lion and the calf, the young cow, will lay together. It'll be like the Garden of Eden all over again. Peace and harmony on the earth. Pretty good, uh, pretty good living, if, you see, if I do say so myself. Um, 
But it doesn't give us a whole lot other than that. There's some in Isaiah there's some prophecies about the the reigning with Christ. And then here it says that we'll take on immortality so we won't die. Imagine what you could accomplish in a thousand years if you didn't die. Think about what you could build. Think about the people you could impact, right? When you come back, you're going to be either a trash man or you're going to be over cities or continents. You could be a governor, governor of, you know, St. John, on the island somewhere, having a judgment seat. But you will, you will decide that. On that day, when all those things are given, when we're at the marriage supper, and Jesus goes to someone and he says, you did so well preparing for this wedding. I'm giving you the Caribbean. And then he goes to you and he says, I'm giving you Phoenix. And you're like, oh. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's nothing wrong with Phoenix. It's hot. Um, no, but if he comes to you and he just says, hey, thanks for coming to my wedding. Did you help? No, you attended the wedding. You were saved. You got to go to the marriage supper, but did you labor? Did you help make that wedding happen? No. Well, then you don't get gifts. You didn't give gifts to all the people that attended. You got your free meal. You got your music, right? You got to see the pretty flowers and the pretty venue. But you don't get gifts. And on that day, you're going to be kicking yourself when somebody gets, you know, some place on earth that they get to rule and reign, whether it's a city, a town, a country, a nation. And you're going to be like, I know them. Be like, yeah, great. Now you get to submit to them. They're going to be your El Presidente. But you'll kick yourself and saying, what I could have done. Think about the fact that you're going to live 70, 80 years down here, if you're lucky, right? 70 to 80 years compared to 1,000. It's just like the parable. He gives him one pound, he turns it into 10. You get less than 100 years, you get 1,000 years on this earth where you get to rule and reign. If you put in the work, you have to just do it. Do it. All right. So the very next verse, Satan gets loose. Revelation 20, uh, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. It says Gog and Magog. Remember, Magog in the Bible constantly gets referenced to as foreign nations. You see, Jesus is going to actually be on the earth for a thousand years. But he's only going to be in one place at one time. Right? He's, he's still a man. He's a glorified man. But he gave up godhood to become a man. So he will be on the earth. And you may be thousands of miles away from him. And you're going to be under the rulership of somebody that he's seen fit to rule and govern over you. Who's going to be telling you, the news tomorrow, Satan will be loosed. He's coming to tempt you. But when it says Magog, it's talking about foreign countries. That foreign means just away. It's away. Christ will be centered in Jerusalem and then far off in the corners of the earth. You're in Russia somewhere. You know, Satan's going to get loosed. And he'll go to deceive the nations to gather them together for battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That is a lot of people. We were talking about it again this morning. I love our morning talks before the Word because it always gives things. We were talking about how the whole once saved, always saved. Sometimes people believe that because you were saved at one time. You know, It says, no one shall pluck me from his hand. That's right. No one can come and take you. But you have the free will to leave that hand at any given moment. But for the people that are still on the fence and like, I still think once saved, always saved. Here in Revelation, you have people who have been born raised in the most wonderful paradise that Jesus has created for them, being handled perfectly. There's no injustice. Everything is fair, right? You're living this perfect life in paradise. And it says they still fall away. It says he brings them, and it says the, uh, the numbers of whom is as the sand of the sea. There's still people that are going to fall away during that millennial reign. But it's important, and it's not. Jesus could say, or God could say, I won't lose Satan again. And then all that th all those people during the thousand-year reign just get to go to heaven for free. But would that be fair to you? Would that be fair to the generations before us who all had temptations and trials, right? Okay. So, and they went up, <clears throat> up on the breadth of the earth, 
and encompass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And here's the good part. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There's no battle. It literally is just like in heaven. When, the angel, when a third of the angels fell, he's like, okay, I see where the line is now. Boom. Done. Now everyone has been given the opportunity to accept Christ. No one was forced into this. All right. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. When Jesus returned, that was one of the first things he did. Beast and false prophet, lake of fire, done. Um, Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now it's done. At that moment, Revelation 20, verse 10, Satan is now put in the lake of fire where he is done. He can never do anything ever again at that point. In fact, he is tormented day and night. So let's move to verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on him, or sat on it, was uh, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Heaven and earth, gone. Only heaven exists now. Not have, remember, heavens being the sky, stars, all that kind of stuff. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, saying small and great is their way of saying everybody, every nation, every rank, king versus peasant, it doesn't matter, uh, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell, so no more death, and hell, the place where everyone was, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever is not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's it. So then Satan gets tossed in. The books get opened. All the dead, the people, if you died, the people who died outside of Noah's Ark, right, have been in hell for 7,000 years. And after this 1,000-year reign, then go up to heaven. And we were talking about it before church, how, man, hell is tormenting. You're completely separate from God. You've never even seen Him. The whole time you're being, you're, you're being, you're, you're either angry or frustrated, in pain, whatever. Then you stand before God. And in that moment, you realize how loving He is. How kind He is. The whole time you're probably thinking that He's this terrible guy with lightning bolts, just ready to singe, you know, burn the hair off your head. But then they come face to face with him on that day of judgment. And they realize that he was really merciful. And they could see all the people who have accepted him. And it says that God is love. They'll feel his presence. For once in their life, they will feel his presence in the throne room. And it says they'll be judged. That's got to be the worst part. The lake of fire and, and, and brimstone and suffering forever and ever is bad. But being able to experience what you could have had is worse. That is the second death. All right. Move move on to uh, Revelation 21, verse 1 through 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea, No more oceans. And I saw John, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. It will be the first time ever that God has stepped foot. And it will be a new earth. Why does he do a new earth and new heaven? 
No remembrance. He doesn't want you to remember anything else. Everything else that's it's passed away. All things have become new. All things are of God. He doesn't want you holding on to the old things of the past where you look at something and all of a sudden you're having this memory of when you lived there one time or your neighbor who used to live there who didn't accept Christ. And the very next verse says, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In that moment, after the judgment has taken place, he has to wipe tears from eyes because there's going to be some sadness. There's going to be some sorrow. We have loved ones or friends or co-workers who didn't accept him or won't accept him. And they're going to be judged. And God's going to wipe all that away, all the tears, all the sorrow, and he's building a whole new earth and he's setting his city on there. And it says that he will dwell with men. And that'll be the first time ever. See, when he created the garden, it was supposed to be this perfect place where he could fellowship man. Man screwed it up. Forever then, the earth was just something he could never touch because God is holy. But here, when he creates this new earth, it'll be perfect and spotless, and then he can actually inhabit it again. <clears throat> All right. Let's talk about, though, this new heaven, or this new earth, I mean, the new Jerusalem. It's pretty impressive. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit. There's an angel carrying John away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, but clear as crystal. And he had a wall great and high and had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. That's a sturdy city. Twelve foundations, and and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. You skip to the next slide, Tiffany. This was a painting done of John sitting on that mountain, but you can see the New Jerusalem in the painting with the all the different uh, foundations and the different gates and everything like that. And that's about how big the new Jerusalem will be. Revelation, uh, verse 16 and 17, the city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city, this angel, measured the city with his golden rod and said he found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide as it is high. A stadia is like an eighth of a mile. It's where we get the word stadium when we do like running and racing and stuff like that. But it's about an eighth of a mile, which means that it is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall. The widest point would be 2,121 miles, roughly the size of the United States, both in width but then also in height. Probably the the greatest thing anyone will ever see, ever. Now, it was, and now if you continue down through the verses, I'm just going to go through some of the facts of what, what everything about it. So it was made of pure gold, like unto clear glass. And if you keep reading the scriptures, he keeps describing it this way. The foundations were made of precious stones like jasper, emerald, sapphire. There were pearl gates. That's where we get the term pearly gates. But this is the best part. There are no temples. There's no churches, no temples found in this city. He gives a reason for it. He says that God and Jesus will dwell together and they are the temple. And their glory and light will shine throughout the whole city. There's no need of a building. There's no need of a, of a place for us to congregate. We'll forever be in the glory of God at that point And be worshiping him and his spirit. <clears throat> There's no sun or moon. The glory of God and Jesus will light the city. It's illuminated solely by the glory of God. How amazing is that? No sun, no moon, just God's light. And nations of the sh- of the saved shall enter it with glory and honor. And out of it, if you continue on into Revelation 22 in the first five verses, a river of life flowing out of the throne of God, and it hits the streets. God has a throne in this city, and this river of life just pours out of it. 
And in the midst of the city, there's a tree. What is that tree? Tree of life. It's come in full circle. He brings us back and creates. This is what mankind was supposed to be. The fellowship with God was supposed to be real and tangible. You were supposed to have that tree of life and these waters of life that would just flow from his temple. Well, not from his temple, from his throne. And the tree of life gets restored in the midst of the city. Amen. I got one more scripture for you, but it's probably the most important one. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. I'm going to paraphrase again because it's King James. But he says, Don't you know that when you run this race and you run it all, everyone runs, but only one receives the prize? So run to win. And every man that striveth for the mastery of things, everything that you try to learn, is temperate in all things. Now they do, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. People master things and do things down here on this earth and they get their crown, but it's a crown here on earth. Their rewards are here on earth. It has no bearing. But we, an incorruptible one. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one who beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means... When I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. I love how he says that. Everyone runs. In a race, everyone runs. But there's no participation awards just saying, hey, the people that do the marathon and get the t-shirt, they run for 500 feet, stop at a donut shop, get a coffee, fly home the next day. I did the Chicago 5K. No, you didn't. But you got the shirt. But he says, run it to win. What is the point in being saved if it's not to further the kingdom of God? If it's not to further his love and and minister to his body, what's the point in running? If all you want to do is get saved, then get saved and then, you know, lay down behind someone's car. We'll back over, pretend you didn't see you, boom, you'll be in heaven. That's really all you want. But we have a greater purpose than that. So he says, run that you may win. And don't work hard at mastery of things for a corruptible crown, for things of this world. It's not going to stand. It's not going to last. We fight, we work, we master for an incorruptible crown. And we don't fight the air. We We fight principalities of darkness who are after our eternal souls. Now there's a whole lot of good that's going to happen to us after that seventh trumpet. Don't you want your friends and family members and co-workers and loved ones to be there with you? Then get out there and do the work. Right? Eternal judgments. The tally's going to run out. They're going to punch in the totals. Boom. And that's your total. You're going to kick yourself in eternity of all you could have done. Don't let your receipt be this short little thing. Like, well, he got saved. Uh, you know, he did. He helped this lady with her roof, a widow in her affliction, and then he died. That should not be your receipt, right? This tiny little thing, and all of a sudden you look at some other guys, it's like <laughs> rolling down the street, and he's like, you know. Run to win. Fight. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Save everyone that you can because there's so much that God has for them. God loves them all so much. Amen?